morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our family worship experience. It's so good to have all the young people here, the children, your whole two, whole one, and all the young people as well. Come on, let's give them all a hand. Praise God. All right, so this morning, my title of my message is BTS. And for those of you who came thinking there was a BTS concert, I'm sorry, there is no BTS concert. It's got nothing to do with Jimin, nothing to do with J-Hope, nor Junko, okay? Nothing, no, no such thing. But I'm sure this message will be dynamite by the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, let's give God a hand. Hallelujah. Okay, I want us all to stand to our feet. Because we're going to read God's Word together, we're going to honour God's Word together, and that's from, I'm going to read from Acts chapter 12, verse 1 to 12, okay? Come on, tell your neighbour, get ready to read God's Word. Because that's the thing that's going to feed you, it's not the words of man, it's the Word from the Lord, amen? Yeah, so this is the Word of the Lord, Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Let's go. What's about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church? intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. Which festival was it? Unleavened bread, okay. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Okay. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the, light, the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. Verse 12, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Slip up your hands to the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, God, that, God, your word is so powerful, oh God. And today, we just want to hear from you. We want to hear your encouragement. We want to hear, Lord faith to arise in our hearts and our spirit as we listen to your voice and your word, O oh God. We thank you for what you have done. We thank you for what you are about to do in our lives. And for all that is going to happen, we pray for open hearts, open spirit, every single person from young, from the youngest to the oldest, O oh God, and every sanctuary online as well, O oh God. In the mighty name of Jesus, let your presence, Lord, move and touch us, O oh God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give him a hand. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. All right. So, BTS. What does BTS stand for? Like I said, it's not your, your, your K-pop gang of boys, you see. It's, uh, it really stands for today. I want to talk about behind the scenes. Okay? Behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. Okay, so this story here tells us something amazing that happened behind the scene. And um, a text tells us that 
It was the amazing escape of Peter from prison. So you see, the king, the king Herod, King Herod at that time was the king overseeing the entire Roman Empire at that time, right? So, and he had already captured James. Okay, Jesus had three BFFs. He had a very, he had 12 best friends, but he had three BFFs, right? And the three best friends, right? And the, the children, you're supposed to write this down. I don't know where it is in your, in, your, in your notes or not. But the three best friends is Peter, James, and Peter, James, and John. Okay, so Peter, James, and John. Now, the Bible tells us here in Acts chapter 12, James had already been captured. James had already been punished and he has already been executed. In fact, he was put to death by sword, which means he was actually beheaded. He got his head chopped off for trusting Jesus. Okay? So that really shook the church. And now, on top of that, the second BFF of Jesus, which is Peter, is also now in jail. They, uh, because when, uh, when Herod killed James, he saw how it made the Jewish people happy. It pleased them. So he was a crowd pleaser. He was so happy that that happened. So he put Peter in jail as well. And he was going to put him on trial, public trial. And most probably, Peter would also be put to death as well. Because this was something that, you know, he wanted to please the Herod wanted to please the Jewish people. He wanted to gain popularity amongst the people. So he caught Peter. He already beheaded James. There is no reason for him not to kill Peter. Right? So there we are. This is the situation where it happened. And now, verse 5 says, Therefore, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. I love that. Right? Peter was in jail. Constant prayer was lifted for him by the church. The church was praying behind the scene. Can somebody say, behind the scenes? Behind the scene, the church was praying behind the scene. Now, sometimes it takes something really hard and tragic to get people to be on their knees and to be desperately seeking the face of God. It took James being beheaded for the church to now gather together and say, oh no, no, now Peter is also in jail. Come on, let's, guys, we've got to really pray. Let's pray earnestly. Sometimes it's like that with our lives as well, right? When a calamity happens, when something tragic happens, when a situation happens in our lives, that's when we also desperately seek God and intercede before the presence of God, correct? We are so desperate when something happens, you know, in our nation. That's why, you know, most of the time, before general elections, our corporate prayers, our prayer encounters will be packed with people. Because we want to pray for desperately for something to happen, Right? When there was an international crisis, when the COVID happened, and everybody gathered together to pray because it was a, a national and international calamity that everybody was struck and everybody was desperate for God to move and do something. So same here, the church was desperate. The church was so desperate because they have seen, their heart was broken, they have seen James, someone beloved by Jesus, he was beheaded. And now, Peter is in prison. And before long, after the whole Passover, after the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, Peter was going to be brought before public for trial. And very soon, Peter will face the same fate as James. So now the church is kanjong. Prayer time. Really, really, they're so worried now. They really, really need to pray and we need to trust God for what's going to happen. So, but I want to say this to us, when you pray, when we all pray privately, God acts and delivers publicly. When we pray privately, God acts and delivers publicly. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So I want us to hear this today. When, we, when the unseen figures pray behind the scene, things happen. When the unseen figures pray behind the scenes, things start happening. Number one. In this situation, it cancelled the appointment with death and destruction. It cancelled the appointment with death and destruction. James has already been beheaded. Peter already got a hearing date, which was supposed to be after the Passover. And Herod was not going to be merciful. 
In fact, Herod could have been probably planning, okay, at first I'm going to torture him like how Jesus was tortured, and then we're going to kill him, and then we're going to see how broken all these people are, and they're going to be so scattered, they're going to be so afraid to follow Christ, and there will be no more trouble. The Jews will not trouble me anymore, and I will be their favorite king. That was probably in his mind. Can't wait for after the Passover to happen. But here we have to see, we see that instead of scattering the church, the church gathered to pray. And they were so worried, they prayed and they prayed and they earnestly prayed. Constant prayers were offered to God for Peter. Of course, God could have done it on his own. Of course, God could have delivered even if nobody prayed in that sense. But you know what? God always causes us and calls us to participate in what he is doing. He always calls us to participate in what He is doing. Because when you start praying, when you start interceding, you become a stakeholder to that situation. And when you are a stakeholder in that situation, it, the burden becomes so much different compared to you watching from the sidelines. When you're a stakeholder in that situation, you will be so desperate for God to do something. And when that breakthrough comes, when that victory happens, you celebrate in a whole different manner because you know God can be dependent on and He's faithful and He is all powerful and He is such a good God. Can somebody say amen? Amen? Yeah, so He calls us to participate in prayer. Some of you have been spared from death and destruction in your life because of unseen prayers behind the scene that has been praying and interceding for you. Some of you have been spared from tragic accidents because of unseen prayers behind the scenes. Some of you have gone through situations in your life where doors seem to be all closed, but because, not because, and somehow amazingly things begin to open, not because you were connected to anyone, but because your connect groups was connected to the King of Kings and they were praying behind the scenes for you and for your situation. Can somebody say amen? People have they've been praying, unseen figures that have been praying behind the scene that has cancelled out death and destruction. This Peter had a day of death. He was going to be tried after the Passover and he was going to die. But because of the prayers of the saints, because of the prayer of the church at that time, it cancelled the appointment with death and destruction. And I want to say this to us, that don't stop praying, don't stop believing God, don't stop, don't stop believing God for the deliverance of that child, of that situation, because you know what? Things that are happening behind the scenes, prayer that are, that's happening behind the scenes are cancelling appointments with death and destruction. Can somebody say amen? I believe it with all my heart that God cancels out all these things. Just after the first service, someone came up to me and shared her testimony about 14, nine, 14 years, no, no, wait, let me see. Nine years, nine, 10 years ago, nine or 10 years ago, she was saying about nine or 10 years ago while she was working here in Malaysia, her son in the Philippines was going through something so, uh, a situation happened and, and a virus entered his body and from there, he just collapsed. A 14-year-old boy just collapsed. He was put into ICU. The mother rushed home immediately and they had intubated him and they had do, done all the things. See, there was paralysis from the neck down suddenly. And they could not find the cause and they were, I don't know what's the name, like some acute, don't know what, what disease, okay? So suddenly a virus just attacked his body and he was down. It means all his muscles, everything stopped functioning. Everyone told the, this lady, you've got to be prepared. He's not going to survive. She trusted God. She said, I trusted God so much and I prayed and I prayed and interceded for 40 days. And at the end of 40 days, the son got out of the ICU and is still alive today after nine years. Come on, let's give God the praise. <laughs> Prayers behind the scenes cancelled the appointment with death and destruction in Jesus' name. I don't know, young person, you are here. Sometimes, a lot of times, you don't understand what you are going through. But you know what? You thank God that your prayers, your parents' prayers have covered you and spared you from death and destruction many times in Jesus' name. Your parents have been praying earnestly for you. Those of you behind, grandparents have been praying because you don't want to see things that are bad that will happen to you. And because of those prayers, it has covered you. It's not because of how clever you are to get out of situations. 
It's the prayer covering of your parents, of your grandparents that have kept you where you are today. Can somebody say amen? amen. Prayers behind the scenes cancels the appointment with death and destruction. May I encourage us as a parent, parents, grandparents who are here, spouses, don't stop praying because God can do things that you and I cannot even imagine in the lives of those you are praying for, in the situation that you are praying for. Don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. He is there and He will see that situation through. He hears the prayers. He hears the cries of His people. Amen. Not only can prayer behind the scene cancel appointments with death and destruction, it also releases rest and confidence in a time of trouble. It releases rest and confidence in a time of trouble. Now, James was killed already, martyred. Peter was about to face Herod and most probably and assuredly given a death sentence. Now, I, I really don't know how big or how strong Peter is. Okay, I, I really don't know. We have seen pictures, right, they, that they pick and they draw Peter. But I don't know how really how big or how strong it is. Why in the world was there 16 guards guarding him? The Bible tells us four squads of four were guarding him. Four squads of four. Four times four is 16. 16 guards that were guarding him and then they had a chain on his left and on his right wrist to bind him. So he was really like some, some what, what, what criminal is this? Is those really terrible criminal, right? That they have to bind him. They, they really bound him. They really, really, really wanted him bound. And they really, really wanted him captured. They, they really, really didn't want him to escape. Okay, so it was 16 soldiers that were watching him. And then he's tied, his chains are chained to left and right on the soldiers. What in the world, man? You know, he's, this is, I mean, he must be really, you know, must be a very dangerous criminal. Must be super dangerous criminal. And scripture tells us in verse 6, and when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Verse 6 tells us the next day, Herod was going to see him. Herod was going to try him. He was going to be tried in public. He was going to face his death judgment. No doubts about it. He was going to die. Okay? And what was Peter doing? What was Peter doing the night before? Sleeping. I'm like, what? And I read the scripture, I went, what? Okay, 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 I read again. Yeah, the Bible tells us, you know, different versions tell us the next day he was going to stand trial before Herod. And the night before he is, and he was not just sleeping, you know. He was not just lightly sleeping. You know how some of us, you, you toss and turn on your bed when you're restless. The next day you have got something, a medical report, when you got a trial or when you got an important meeting, you toss and turn, right? You, you try and sleep. Then, okay, how many of you, right? How many of you, when someone turns on the light in your room, you wake up when you're sleeping. Okay, only two. The rest all... Goya <laughs> already. Never mind, it's okay. You're like Peter. Peter was like that, okay? Because the Bible tells us when the angel came to the prison cell, a light shone in the prison. ka -ching! Turned on the light. And guess what? Peter didn't wake up. It was unperturbed. He didn't wake up. He didn't wake up. He didn't open his eyes until the angel had to strike him. Hello, Peter, wake up. The Bible tells us the angel struck his side and tell him, Peter, get up. And then he gets up and he's like, oh, okay, okay, get up, huh? okay, get up. He wakes up and he's really out of it, okay? He's like really asleep, asleep. He's so asleep that the angel had to tell him, please put on your clothes. Please wear your shoes. Please put on your clothes. Nobody wants to see you naked running outside. Okay, please. Okay? Uh, please put on your clothes. Eh? 
And he's obediently doing all that, okay, doing all that. Then they, they get out of the prison, the, the, the chains fall off the wrist, they get out of prison, they pass the first guard post, they pass the second guard post, they come to the iron gate which automatically opens for them. Somehow that day also got auto gate, but okay? Ding, or open the gate, auto gate open, and then they walked out of this iron gate, and after one street later, the angel finally left him, then only he's awake. Oh... This is not a dream. Ah. It's real. I'm really set free. After that whole drama of in the, in, in the prison cell, guard post, guard post, door open, and then he walks one street, then only he is actually awake. Can you imagine how asleep he was? He was that rested and that at peace. Although he was going to stand trial before Herod the next day and probably face a death sentence, he could rest in such an assurance that God was with him. Wow. This tells me two things. Number one, Peter, this is not Peter's first drama. This was not Peter's first thing that he's gone through in his life and he knows so for sure that if God could do it before, God can do it. If God can do it before, God can do it again. So Peter was very sure. This was not his first time that he was going through challenges, he was going through persecution, he was going through all these things. He was not afraid. If God can deliver me before, He can deliver me again. I've just got to sleep. I'll just have to sleep. Whatever happens, I'll leave it in the hands of God. And someone needs to hear this today. You just need to sleep. Because you know what? Jesus says in his word, right? He ne neither sleeps nor slumbers. So one person awake enough, you don't need to stay awake. Okay? You can rest. Because he neither sleeps nor slumbers and he's handling the situation. Amen? So that was number one. Number two, I asked us to take note of the time when this happened just now as we were reading the scripture. And it tells us this, the whole, this whole situation happened during the feast of the unleavened bread, okay, and the Passover. Okay, so what does this, why did the Jews celebrate the feast, celebrate this feast of unleavened bread? Now, the feast of unleavened bread was a reminder of how quickly God delivered the Israelites from the Egyptians in Exodus, in, in the Old Testament Exodus. Remember when the, all the Israelites were enslaved by Egyptians in Exodus, in the book of Exodus, right? And how quickly, overnight, very quickly, God delivered all of them. And when they said, celebrate the bread, they were asked to make unleavened bread. What was unleavened bread? How many of you actually bake breads? Don't be shy, like, Brigitte can put high, high on the hand, it's okay. I want, you can make some for me as so, well. Okay. <laughs> now, unleavened bread is bread made without yeast. Okay, so made without yeast. So when, when you make a bread with yeast, okay, you have to proof the bread, meaning after you have put the yeast into the dough, you got to leave it there until it rises for about an hour. Right? An hour or so. Then it will rise, whoop, and then you can shape it again, let it rise a bit more, then you can put it in the oven. Now, when they were asked to make the unleavened bread, it was to show that when God delivers His people, you don't even have time for your bread to rise. You don't even have the time to wait for that one hour for your bread to rise because when God does his deliverance work, it will be just with a blink of an eye, it will be overnight and you cannot even wait for your bread to rise, you cannot wait for all, that's why they were asked to make unleavened bread. It was a reminder of the swiftness and of the quickness God can move in their lives and God has moved in their lives, okay, are we clear? Where was the unleavened bread? Number two, why the Passover? It was this season, it was a Passover season, remember in the time of in the Egyptian time. And the Lord was going to send an angel of death even into the entire place. And God told Moses to tell his people to put the smear the blood on their doorposts. And when the angel of death was to pass that doorpost and, and he saw the blood there, he would spare the people from the home. 
right? And destroyed, and that was when they, he destroyed the e Egyptians and the firstborn of the Egyptians and so on, right? So that's where you see that happening. And after that, God delivered the entire nation of Israel out. Two million people were delivered in an instance. That was the Passover. It was a reminder of how God delivered the entire nation of Israel out from the hands of the Egyptian. Now, this had to happen at this time. And I'm sure as the church, and a lot of them who were previously Jews as well, a lot of them were probably, last time they practiced all this and they knew all these stories. As they were praying, they knew that they were celebrating Passover. They knew that they were celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it was at this time, it was a reminder that when God delivers, it's going to happen so quickly. And if God can deliver two million people overnight, can He not deliver Peter from the jail? If God can deliver an entire nation, can God not deliver your son, your daughter, and you from your situation? If God can deliver so many people all at once, what a reminder it was for them to know that this is the same God that delivered an entire nation is able to deliver and set Peter free in Jesus' name. Can somebody say amen? Amen, amen. Come on, let's give him the praise for that. I don't know who is watching or what circumstances you're going through, but those of you online, if you know, you know that you know. And sometimes you think that God is not hearing your prayers, but here I'm here to remind you if God can deliver an entire nation, God can see you through in your situation. God can see your child through. God can see you through whatever, whatever the problem and the trouble and the trial is, God can see you through and deliver you from it. Amen? Amen. So it not only it does, it, does, it releases that supernatural peace. So supernatural confidence and rest. Peter slept. He slept. Whatever that you're going to face this week, submit it to the Lord. Get people to pray along with you and rest in Him. Rest in Him. Thirdly, prayers of unseen figures behind the scene not only releases rest and confidence, it releases Supernatural interventions. Supernatural interventions. How many of you know that our God is supernatural? Yeah, I, I, I know that. I hope all of you remember that. He's not like a man. He's not like a human being who, has, who are limited, who have limitations. God is supernatural. And when we pray to a God that is supernatural, He releases supernatural interventions. So the followers of Jesus Christ who are now feeling helpless, there was nothing that they could do, they could possibly do physically to go against the highest commander and the, the most powerful person which was King Herod. There was nothing they could do. What could they do? They don't have weapons, they don't have anything else, they can't fight them. They can't fight the Roman soldiers. They can't fight them. There was nothing that they could do. They felt hopeless seeing, seeing James being beheaded. And now Peter is seized and they're going to, and he's, they're going, he's going to be tried very, very soon. They were all so desperate for a miracle. And how many of us have gone through those seasons where you feel so out of control? You've done everything that you could, but you cannot do anything more. There is nothing more that you can do. Nothing more. Nothing more that possibly as a human being that you can do. They could not, there was no Mission Impossible, no Ethan Hunt, no, no Agent 007 that they could send in. There was nothing, nothing that they could do because he was heavily guarded in such a huge prison cell and he was, this was it. What can you do? You felt so helpless in those moments when your loved one is in the hospital when you have that major meeting that you need to have with your whatever bosses or your clients, etc., and there is nothing more you can do. Nothing more. You feel like, God, I'm, what, what, what? There's nothing more. And this church felt that way. There was nothing more that they could do. 
But all they could do was come in desperation before God in prayer. That's what they did. They prayed. Behind the scenes prayer of the church, they caused a supernatural intervention to take place. In this case, God summoned an angel to go into the heavily guarded cell where no man could have gone in. God sent an angel to go in there, supernaturally appeared in front and supernaturally opened the gates for them, supernaturally got off the, the, the chains from his wrist and walked through the prison doors. Psalms 91 verse 11 declares, it says this, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Now this verse tells us the extent of God's protective care that he will even dispatch angels to ensure your safety and to ensure your well-being for those who trust in him. He sends angels out to protect us Supernaturally, supernatural interventions that you and I cannot explain. I remember about eight, about eight years ago, my mother was alone at home in my sister's place. And she told us this, it was that day she actually passed out, she fainted. Yeah, they, I mean, she was in her late 70s at that time. Um, she passed out and she remember when she was out, she, in a, it was either a, same, like, same like Peter, like, it's either a vision or she actually opened her eyes, we don't know. She said she actually saw two figures that were bright, that were standing in a distance. And I remember telling, she telling me this in Chinese, Hai ye so ge man tou. means it's Jesus' disciples. So, right? so I'm thinking to myself, when did you ever see Jesus' disciples' face before? How you know it's Jesus' disciples, you know? So, <laughs> right? I, I am assuming it's just some angelic being la, that were there. So she, she saw these two angel, these beings, these figures there, and they approached her, they lifted her up. And she told them, I don't want to go yet. Because, oh, they, they told her, you need to get up. So they told her in Chinese. So then as I realized, oh, angels can speak Chinese one. Okay, yeah. So they got her up and she told them, I don't want to go yet. I want to see my grandchildren grow up. So they didn't answer her. They didn't say anything to her. They just put her hand on the table as soon as she could stand and get a grip. They left. I don't know what happened there. But she had an encounter with, with a supernatural intervention because all this while, every time when we pray, we pray, God, please protect her, please protect her, please protect her, you know? Because we, are not, we cannot be there 24-7. So God, please protect her. And when, we that, when you pray that kind of prayers over your father, your mother, your children, over your situations, God can intervene supernaturally and divinely save those he need to save. Come on, let's give him a praise. I haven't seen angels personally before, you know, and so, but some people, some of you have told me before, oh, when you were ministering, there was an angel on your right and there were angels around you. I'm like, wow, thank you, Jesus, you know, very good, you know, I, I'm so glad because I thank God that the angels are here supporting me because there are so many times when I'm standing here or when I'm ministering, I'm leading worship and there are moments where, you know, honestly, really, I'm so tired and so exhausted and yet, thank God, the ministering angels, the angels were around God sent angels to lift me up and, that, and the, with the power of the Holy Spirit has anointed me and uh, able to continue to do what I'm doing today. Come on, let's give Him the praise. He sends supernatural intervention because there are prayers made behind the scenes. Many of you, I remember as we prayed for those prayer cards. So many of you say, you know, we're going to pray for a breakthrough in my family, pray for a breakthrough in my parents, pray for a breakthrough, a healing for this, a healing for that, healing of relationships. Don't stop praying. Because supernatural interventions are taking place. 
don't lose heart. Supernatural interventions are taking place in the lives of those you are interceding for. Amen. You gotta believe it. Young person, every child, every parent, every grandparent here, let's continue to intercede because God can send about that deliverance that happens so quickly that you won't even believe it. Amen. And this, finally is this. It drives, some, it drives troubles away for good. Whew. It drives troubles away for good. Now, the people prayed behind the scene. Peter was supernaturally released. There was a supernatural prison break. And now, brilliant, he's a fugitive. The Bible tells us the next day, they all went out to look for him. The guards were looking for him and, and, and Herod was so upset, he sent off the guards to look for him and they were, they were trying to track him down. I remember some years ago when we were in Singapore, there were roadblocks everywhere. You were thinking, what in the world is happening in the roadblocks everywhere in Singapore? And that year was the year where there was actually somewhat escape from the Singapore prison. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, correct. Everybody said, oh, can we in Singapore? So can happen. Yeah, I actually can. So apparently, someone escaped from the Singapore prison and they were setting up roadblocks everywhere to, 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 to hunt him down. There was a manhunt. And I'm sure this was a situation as well. Herod is sending out for a manhunt. They're trying to track down where Peter is. The K9 unit is out, sniffing him out and, uh, and trying to get where to find his location and where all the, 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 the disciples are and they're all trying to, to, trying to find him. So now, what? Does Peter now have to live as a fugitive for the rest of his life? Does Peter have to live like a fugitive for the rest of his life? Does Peter now have to now have underground church to preach the gospel? Does Peter now have to be smuggled to another state because now he escaped from the prison and he's going to, he's in trouble now? Everybody recognize him, wanted pic pictures all over town. When God does something, He doesn't do it halfway. <laughs> he never does it halfway and He will always finish it all the way. The prayers behind the scene did so much more than just set Peter free from prison so that he can be a fugitive. Nope. The Bible tells me at the end of that same chapter, in Acts chapter 12, right at the end of Acts chapter 12, something happens in verse 21 to 23. And it tells us this. On the appointed day, Herod wearing his royal robe sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of God, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died. Hmm. The man who was causing the problem, the man who had beheaded James, who was about to kill Peter, and now he was on the manhunt for Peter, is no longer a problem because some worms got to him and he died. The problem, the trouble was completely eradicated in Jesus' name. God does not bring you out from one problem to lead you into another problem. God did not bring Peter out from the prison so that he will be a fugitive and be another problem for, you know, for everyone because everyone will be so afraid to run with him. God did not bring you out from your situation to leave you there in a deeper, in another, another problem. He will see you through because he who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion in Christ Jesus. Can somebody say Amen. Amen. So Peter was not going to have to be worried anymore because God had dealt with the problem. What God started, God 
finishes completely and the problem was gone in Jesus' name. Come on, somebody here needs your problems gone completely. Not just temporarily, but completely cut off in Jesus' name. We need that. Because you know what? Some problems keep on recurring and recurring and recurring. And we say enough is enough. God, when you get me out of the problem, you will get it, me out completely. Even if it takes worms to get rid of the problem. I've seen how God delivers. He starts and He will complete. I've seen how He has, we've prayed for people and how God has removed bosses, how God has removed certain colleagues, how God has changed school principals, how God has opened doors when they all seem to be shut and are supposed to be shut because of prayers behind the scene. He's a God that finishes, that can finish what He starts and what He does is complete. Amen. So don't stop praying in the background. Don't stop praying behind the scenes. He hears every private prayer and makes His power public. He hears every private prayer and He makes His power public so that we can give Him all the glory and all the honour that's due His name. Now, I'm sharing all this with you not as if it's some lofty motivational talk. I'm sharing this with you because it has happened many times in the lives of the people that we've stood with in prayer. It's happened many times even in my own life. I want us to bring up that picture This baby was sent to us about four and a half months ago to Juara home. And I remember bringing her up for prayer during our prayer encounter, that first, the second week when we had her. She is a baby that has come from a very difficult past. And she was born with a cyanotic, complex cyanotic heart disease, which means her heart it's very complex. Okay, it's very complex. It's so complex that, after, in fact, what happened was every time people had come to visit from the different foundation came to visit her in the hospital, the nurses in the hospital would refer, oh, mau tengok baby itu ah. Katil sepuluh, bila bila mau, bila bila masa boleh mati. That was how they would term her. She's in bed 10, and she can die any time because her heart situation was that bad. They didn't think that she would survive through the month, but she did. She survived through the first month and there was nothing more medically that they wanted to do or they, wasn't, they were willing to do because it was just too complicated. They wanted to discharge her. The adoptions that were supposed to take place all fell through because she's so sick. Three other homes rejected her. The social welfare was going to bring her and send her to a place in Jitra for unwanted children. But someone said, no, we will discharge her. We will somehow find a home. And they got in touch with Cecilia from Rumah Juara. After talking and thinking through, we said, okay, by faith, let's take this baby in. So she came to our home we didn't know how, how it's going to happen, but she was like a normal child. She doesn't need oxygen, nothing. She's just like a normal child. So we've, we treated her like a normal child. We took care of her and uh, we brought her for second opinion in different hospitals. They did the echo and they did ECGs and every time they would do... So from, from, uh, from Glen Eagles then, and uh, then after that, she was transferred even to PPUM and, and she, we saw, we just saw different, different car beats, cardiologists and they did all the echoes and all the echoes showed us 
that her heart is very messed up. Very messed up. Your arteries which are supposed to be going back to your heart is going to her liver and to her stomach. That's how messed up it is. So, the last two visits ago, when they did their first echo at PPUM, the cardiologist, I asked her, I said, is there any chance as she grows bigger and you all repeat this echo, can, can things change in the heart? She looked at me, no lah. No. Because usually, you know, this is the best time for us to scan her heart and it's always, it will remain the same. That's it. And the last two weeks ago, she had a follow-up with PPUM cardiology. And they looked at her. They checked her again and they said, hmm, maybe she is worth a referral back to IJN to see a Pete's cardiologist there. So they had a discussion. They wrote a letter. And that letter says, please see this baby, da da da. She is a growing and thriving child. She meets the growth, na 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 na. This baby is not even supposed to survive a few weeks, yeah. We were told many times, just be prepared, just be prepared, just be prepared. She was transferred, I'm sorry, she was referred to IJN and we brought her there just this Friday, two days ago. We spent almost an entire day at IJN. They did the whole test again. They did the echo, the ECG, the chest x-rays and the, everything they did again. And this time, the doctor came to me, came to Cecilia and I, and we were standing there and he goes, oh, okay, okay, reading, mm, okay. Can, we can, uh, we, can uh, we can talk about surgery? I looked at him, I went, huh? What do you mean surgery? All this while, from beginning to now, everybody has been telling us surgery is not possible because it was just too difficult and her heart is too messed up, cannot fix already, la la la. And that was the narrative that I have been having the whole time. So I wasn't expecting this, oh yeah, we can plan for surgery. Same like that servant girl who actually went to the door when Peter actually appeared before them. She was so overjoyed, she, she slammed the door and Peter and she ran back. That's what the Bible says in Acts chapter 12. So I was the same thing. I'm like, huh? What, what do you mean surgery? Wait, 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 wait. And, and so we got into the room and he explained further. He said, oh, today's echo, today we see actually her heart not so bad lah as before. I'm like, huh? What do you mean? How did that happen? How did God change? How did that repair happen? When nobody else could do it, when nobody, everybody told us from beginning of time until now that it could not happen. And he said, we're going to repair. She, today, just now she came for the first service and we prayed for her. Because just about before 12 just now, she was admitted to IJN for a CT scan. They're going to do an entire detailed scan on her and they want to discuss surgery plans after the CT scan. When God, when there's prayers behind the scene, it cancels appointment with death and destruction in Jesus' name. When God is behind the scenes, it releases at peace over us to trust Him that He's able to do it. When God, when we pray behind the scenes, God is able to release supernatural intervention. When I cannot put my hand inside to fix her heart, God puts His hands into her cavity, into her chest cavity, and fixed it, and made it possible for more miracles to take place. And when it happens, it happens so quickly. Everything happened yet that day. When he goes, oh, admitted on Sunday, this is Friday. I'm like, huh? Admitted on Sunday for what? what? What's going on? So we're all like, so glam kabut already, you know. She was just admitted just now. The CT scan is tomorrow morning and she will be discharged after tomorrow. And then we will see how it goes from there. But from a child that was proclaimed as a child that was going to die anytime to where she is today, God has already done the miracle in her life. Come on, let's give him the praise. She almost turns six months soon. Yes. Six months old. God is able. God is able. He's able to turn situations around. And at that same day on Friday, we thank God for God providing for that visit. We thank God 
this particular CT scan and admission was going to cost us an X amount as well, a, a huge amount as well. But somehow, not because of connections we know from people, although they made some calls, but I know the ultimate connection is because we were connected to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Somehow, this particular visit, that this particular stay and the CT scan, the entire cost is a blanket cover by Yayasan IJN. Come on, let's give God the praise. Because God will never bring you out of a, one problem to lead you into another problem. He will provide for her every step of the way. All the way to the end until God does that complete miracle and you will see her standing here running around praising Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's how powerful our God is. Prayers behind the scenes that can turn situations around. He's able to do it for Peter. He's able to do it for Naomi. He's able to do it for you. Amen. Let's give him praise. Thank you, Lord.